So we're starting off the new year fasting and praying. And through this sermon series, begin the process of facing the giants in our lives. We'll face them not by might nor by power, but by God's spirit. During this sermon series, we will specifically face certain giants. We'll face the giant of fear, the giant of rejection, the giant of comfort or complacency, the giant of anger, and the giant of addiction. Those are probably the giants that most people are facing, at least one of them, sometimes more of them, in our lives. So we want to confront them head on with the scriptures. You won't want to miss any of these messages over the next few weeks. And I want to let you know there might even be some giants that you're not even aware of, and you'll come to discover that as we preach about them in this sermon series. Now, as I said, the sermon series is based on a book by Pastor Louis Giglio. It's, the book is entitled Goliath Must Fall. And it, like I mentioned, there'll be a few available after service in the foyer uh, for $13 each. Now, this book is based out of the, one of the most well-known uh, stories in the Bible. We probably, most of us, if not all of us, have heard the story of David and Goliath. Uh, David was a teenager who faces a nine-foot giant named Goliath. He was a champion, a warrior, and David defeated him. Now, it, it, has become to be, it has become the most used analogy, uh, not just in the church, but even outside of the church, to speak about or analyze uh, uh, what, is, what is considered seemingly unsurmountable, insurmountable odds. So whenever anybody's an underdog, anybody is, is perceived to have no chance to succeed or win, we say it's a David and Goliath situation, seemingly impossible or insurmountable odds. So even outside of the church, not just in Christendom, but uh, even in the world, the story of David and Goliath is, David and Goliath is known, and it's used to speak of uh, somebody as small, you're small in comparison to the, the giant or the obstacle that you're facing, and uh, you're gonna, they win because they're the David and they beat the Goliath. Amen? So the story of David and Goliath is found, as we read in Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. At the time, just for context, King Saul is the king of Israel. He's the first king of Israel. David, the little boy who fought Goliath in the field, would later become the second king of Israel. Now, the Philistines, Goliath was of the nation of Philistine. The Philistines and Israel were always going at it. They, always, they were always fighting each other in battle. And so the Philistine, in this story, as we read, the Philistine army is on, on one mountain, and Israel is on the other mountain with the valley in between, the valley of Elah. And so each morning, this Philistine warrior champion would come out. He'd go down the mountain into the middle of the valley, and he'd come and he'd taunt Israel the army of Israel. He'd say, come on. And he'd taunt their God and he'd curse and talk about their God. And he'd say, you guys don't want to fight me. My God is greater than your God. Your God can't beat me. And you're saying that out of his own flesh and pride because he had personally succeeded in battle. So he's taunting them. And Israel, even though they had seen God do so many miracles, defend them in so many ways, uh, even defeat Pharaoh, their history says our God has always fought for us and given us the victory in any battles, whether they're personal or na national battles. God has always fought for us, and we have always won. Amen. So Goliath would taunt and mock them and their God. And uh, the response of the Israelite army and nation was very unimpressive. For 40 days, Goliath would come out and taunt them, and mock them, and challenge them. And they were afraid, and we read, they're afraid. They're terrified. And there's not one soldier who would take the challenge and go down and face off against Goliath. Not one man in all the land of Israel would come. It had gotten so much, so bad, that the king of Israel, Saul, was offering incentives. He's like, I'll give you great wealth. Your family won't have to pay income taxes. How many? I mean, I think I might fight if I didn't have to pay no income taxes. I mean, I, I don't know, you know. I, I, at least, I at least give it a try, you know. But not even that. Pay the no taxes. And then Saul says, you can even marry my, wife, my daughter. Not my wife, my daughter. I'll let you marry my daughter, which means you'll be part of the royal family and you'll live in prestige and royalty. No one, not even with those incentives, would take, would take on the challenge of Goliath. To them, he seemed too big and strong. Now, what does that have to do with us? 
Many of us today face a similar predicament every day. Even though we're not facing literal giants, we're facing some kind of insurmountable challenge or problem that tears into our life every day. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's an anger problem. Maybe a feeling of rejection in our lives that affect so many areas of our lives. Have you ever felt like King Saul or the Israelite army? That some kind of giant is standing before you, taunting you, harassing you, insulting you, intimidating you every day? Day after day, this giant is robbing you of your power. You tried so many approaches to stop the taunts, but you literally feel immobilized. Have you ever felt that way? Held back? slowed or stopped from moving forward in a healthy way. And ultimately, if you're facing that, you know you're not living the life that you're supposed to be living and that you want to live in Christ. Now, there are giants in our life, and they harm us, and they rob us of the glory of God in our lives. See, God wants us to live free. I said God wants us to live free. God wants your giants to fall. I need a good amen on that one. I said, God wants your giants to fall. He wants you to live without chains to bind you. He wants you to live not not restricted by limiting beliefs. And you can. We can. We can live free. But we must realize first that it's not just a simple wish that our giant will fall someday. I mean, Goliath wasn't just going to walk into the middle of the valley and just one day pass out and die. It wasn't going to happen that way. They didn't sit up there wishing, I wish, I wish, and maybe like Dorothy clicked their heel together three times and maybe the giant will fall. It wasn't going to happen that way. The giant must be confronted. The giant must, must be confronted and It's not just a wish, but it's a mandate. Goliath must fall. The Goliath in your life must fall. And so what we must first realize, the beginning point of this, now listen, please. The truth is Goliath has already fallen. Goliath has already fallen. If you know that, you're already on the way to your victory and your freedom. The same is true of all of our giants. The real work has already been done by Christ when he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. He has defeated all of our foes. He has conquered all of our giants. They have fallen by the Son of God's hands. Your giant has already been defeated because of what Christ has done, and yet it's going to fall too because we are going to put in motion what Christ has already done for us. The giant must go down. The giant has gone down, and the giant will go down in Jesus' name. Now, we just need to take responsibility for our part in the process. We need to press in. We need to lean forward in faith and action and do and walk in everything that Christ has determined that we are to walk in for his glory and honor. Listen, any voice in our head. Any taunt by any giant must be and will be silenced in Jesus' name. We need to lean into the work of Christ and activate all that he has done for us. Are you following me? We all, we all face, again, we all face giants. Now, please don't sit here and tell me there's not one thing, not one giant that you're, you've ever faced in your life. I mean, praise God. I know we have a lot of victory in a lot of areas of our life, but sometimes there's giants that we don't even realize that we're so used to, so accustomed to, we just live with them. And, I'm, and maybe you have complete victory in Jesus, and praise God for that, but I don't want you just to just basically ignore what I'm saying and not even give a room to the possibility that there may be something, some part of a giant fa- that you're facing in your life. There's some giant that possibly is trying to either, either is in your life or trying to make its way into your life and taunt you. And maybe there's a giant that you battle off and on. It's time to confront that giant once and for all and, and take him out in Jesus' name. Are you following me? I just wouldn't, my, my point in that is that 
I just want, I don't want our pride to prevent us from saying, I'm, oh, I'm Pastor John. I've been serving God 30 years. I'm a pastor of the historical church called Temple de la Cruz in Hayward, California. And so no giants going to, no, ain't no giants in my life. I don't want to be that prideful. Only pride would make a statement like that. Humility would say, you know what? Let me review the giants. Let me review fear. Maybe it's not, it's not paralyzing fear, but maybe there's an area of my life that's impacted by a giant of fear. And I need to confront that in Jesus' name. Maybe, I, maybe anger, maybe addiction, maybe something else, maybe comfort, uh, maybe rejection. Right? There's people, there's people in this room. I'm sure maybe your dad and mom separated or divorced. That can, that can reflect now in rejection in your life. Oh, why would my dad walk out on me? Or why would my mom walk out on me? Maybe you never met your biological father or mother. Right? Instantly, you're dealing with rejection because why didn't they love me enough to stay? Right? Because it's the natural thing to do. Maybe in school. Maybe in school you were rejected. Um, you know, maybe in your family. Who knows? And you, and you might feel like, I dealt with it. I, I put it under the blood. But isn't it, isn't it wise to go back and go, let me just make sure this isn't affecting me. That there's not actually a giant there lurking. Amen? Amen. We, we have to face every... We have to face Every scripture, every message, every teaching, every preaching with a humble heart, teachable heart, not, will, not saying, oh, I don't face any giants because I'm just that victorious in Christ. Uh, we need to face it with a humble heart, let, giving room to the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Amen? So how do we get rid of these giants? It starts with seeing and believing that whatever giant we're battling might be big, but it's not bigger than Jesus. No matter how big the giant, 9 foot, 10 foot, 11 foot giants, it's not bigger than Jesus. I said it's not bigger than Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell him he's not bigger than Jesus. Look at your other neighbor and tell him he's not bigger than Jesus. Look at one more person and say, ain't nobody bigger than Jesus. <laughs> I feel like T.D. Jake, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Ain't nobody bigger than Jesus. Ain't nobody bigger than Jesus. Ain't nobody bigger than Jesus. <laughs> Man, I feel anointed just leading back like that. That's... I mean, no dishonor to T.D. Jakes. I love that man. I, but I just, I just felt that spirit, you know, just rise up in me. There's no giant bigger than Jesus. Remember, God has prepared us to get rid of any giant or to face any giant in our lives. God prepared David. Remember he said, I defeated the lion and I defeated the bear. And God will give this giant into my hands. It was training. God had been training him. See, whatever giant you and I are facing in our lives, God has already been working in your life and preparing you. You can face that giant. You can face that giant. You can face that giant because God has already been preparing you with scriptures, with experiences, with encounters, with truths from his word. You've over, already overcame other things, and all, every, every victory God has given you is so that you can face the giant that's in your life. You can look back and say, God helped me defeat that giant. He'll help me defeat this giant too. <laughs> See, this isn't about trying harder. This isn't about rolling up our sleeves and working to improve our lives through our own efforts. It's not about that at all. Our best efforts will always fall short. The message is that God extends his grace and favor towards us to allow us to experience his supernatural power. It's about us agreeing with him and letting his Holy Spirit work in our lives to put us on right paths, right way of thinking, and living. I think most of us have heard and read the story of David and Goliath, and it's always presented to us in, in a certain way, right? We're always told, we're always told, in the story, sometimes in youth camps, sometimes in, in revival services or other messages, uh, conferences, we're always, to, we're always told basically, like, David, and, David confronts Goliath, and you need to be like David. You need to pick up your sling, and you need to fling that stone into your giant's head, and Goliath is going down in your life, right? And we kind of get all inspired and all encouraged, and, we, and maybe for a, a day, Maybe by the, to the end of the service, maybe to the end of the weekend or the week, and we feel like, yeah, we feel inspired and encouraged, and yeah, I'm going to face my giant, and I'm going to take him down just like David, and we're told, you are David in that story. 
Right? Have you ever been, have you ever heard that before? You're David, you need to confront your giant and go forth and do like David did. Have you ever, have you ever, do you, have you ever heard that before? Have you ever heard that before? That you're David and you need to take out your giant? I've heard that before. Have you heard that before? Or how come you're afraid to answer me? <laughs> have, you, have you ever heard that before? It's like a trick question. I like Jesus. I'm setting you up with a question. And you, no matter how you answer it, it's going to be wrong, right? That's what you think. I'm not that Christ-like yet, but I, I hope to be one day. <laughs> right? Jesus just asked questions, and just, no matter how you answered it, you just weren't going to get it right. Right? And, and, Jesus, and Jesus would uh, then give you the truth. So, but we're, we're end of the service, end of the weekend, end of the week. And then we go right back to our giants taunting us, though. We're told to go and confront this giant like David, and at the end of the week, right, it's true. How many times have we been inspired that way, and then we go face a giant, it's like it's still taunting us at the end of the week. Kind of the goosebumps and the, the, the inspiration has kind of died down, um, and their giants still there taunting us. And let me tell you why this happens. Are you ready? Let me, it's a really good reason why this happens. Do you want me to tell you why it happens? Are you, are you ready for me to tell you how this happens? Because it, it does happen, right? I mean, it, it happens, right? It happens. It just happens. Let me tell you why this happens. Are you ready for me to tell you why this happens? I need a drink before I tell you why, why is that happening. Oh, you guys are so impatient. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Pray for patience during this fast, all right? <laughs> Let me tell you why this happens. Are you ready? Because this is deep revelation right here. This is deep revelation that I'm about to give you. You know why this happens? Because we're not David in the story. That's why. We're not David. You're not David, and I'm not David. You're not David. I'm not David. <laughs> Even if you're a female, you're not Davida. You're not David. We're not David in the story. Let me tell you why we're not David in the story. Because that's a man-centered interpretation. That's man's, uh, now we're putting ourselves in, that's man's interpretation. That's not God's interpretation in the story. Do you know who David is actually in the story? You know who's actually David in that story? Jesus is David in that story. I said Jesus is David in that story. Jesus is David in the story of David and Goliath. Why? Because Jesus is the giant killer. We're not the giant killers. Jesus is the giant killer in the story. Je it's Jesus, and he fights the battle for us. It's Jesus that stares down the impossible odds. It's Jesus that takes his sling and flings a stone and takes, out, takes aim at the giant and knocks him out and kills him. It's Jesus. It's the work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary that defeated every single one of the giants that we face in our life, whether it's fear, rejection, complacency, anger, or addiction, or any other giant. It's Jesus who takes that giant out in our lives. It's Jesus. I said it's Jesus. I said it's Jesus. It's not you and me. It's Jesus. Look, at, if it's me or it's you, then we can't, we can't live under that kind of pressure. We, we're not meant to sustain the kind of pressure and responsibility that there's a giant standing in front of my life and I got to take it out. Well, the truth of the matter is before we knew Christ, there was all kinds of giants standing in front of us. And no matter how good we tried to be, how strong we tried to be, we never defeated one giant in our life. And so it was never us. That's why we needed Jesus Christ to come, die on the cross, shed his blood, be buried, raised on the third day. He said, I'll conquer any giant. He said, I conquered death. I conquered hell. I conquered the grave and I'll conquer any Goliath that's standing in your
your way. Jesus is the giant killer. Wish not us. It's not us. Jesus is the giant killer. Jesus is the giant killer. See, if I grab the sling and the stone, I miss. If you grab the, the sling and the stone, you're going to miss. You're not hitting the giant in the forehead on your own. It's Jesus, the giant killer, who fights our battles and defeats our giants. It's the finished work of the cross that permits us to defeat the giants in our life. If we think it's us, see, if I take out the giants in my life, who gets the glory? If you take out the giants in your life, who gets the glory? It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. We, but we always want to take things into our own hands. We want to fight our giants on our own, but it's too much. It's really, it's really challenging for us, even as, as sons and daughters of God, uh, believers. It's hard for us to just let God do his thing. We just need to let God do his thing. Rest in our victory. We don't fight for victory. See, we're still fighting for victory. We've, we're supposed to be fighting from victory because Jesus won the victory 2,000 years ago. We're fighting from victory. It's already been done. Goliath is already dead. Now you just need to partner with God. It's all about believing. It's all about faith in God, trusting him. We have to trust him. Even when he's silent, we have to trust him. Even when we don't see him moving, we need to trust him. He's trustworthy. He's trustworthy. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. He'll take care of us. He will take care of us. He'll take care of you. And he'll fight your giants. Just let him fight your giants through you. Your, our only thing is to stand firm and trust in the Lord and have faith and believe him at his word. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not David. Look at your other neighbor and say, you're not David. Tell him Jesus is David. See, so the giant falls because of the work of Jesus. We're called to participate with Jesus, follow his leadership, and align ourselves with him and what he's doing. Jesus died to defeat our giants. Goliath is dead. Somebody say, Goliath is dead. See, 1 John 3 says, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He, he destroys the work of our giants. See, our greatest defense against the giants is to lean into the all-sufficiency of Christ and let him do what he does. Lean into the all-sufficiency of Christ. Now, you may have heard that before, all-sufficiency. The all-sufficiency of Christ simply means this. I'm not trying to use big words just, I, I want you to understand what that means. It's just a, a theological phrase that is often used. But the all-sufficiency of Christ simply means this. Jesus is enough. I said, Jesus is enough. We don't need any, It's not Jesus plus anything. There's no, there's no, no Jesus and my efforts, Jesus and my strength, Jesus and my connections, Jesus and my network, Jesus and my finances, Jesus and Jesus. There's no Jesus and. Jesus is enough. If you're looking for more Jesus and something else, you don't need, you don't need anything else. Jesus is enough. Lean, press into the all-sufficiency of Christ. Jesus is enough. Jesus, I'm going to say it again. Maybe I can get a good amen. Je I said Jesus is enough. He is all we need. If you have Jesus, you have it all. More money, more degrees, more stuff is not going to make you happier. More Jesus will make you happier. And, and, and probably happy is not even the word. It's joyful. See, happiness comes and goes. Joy just, just stays there. It like warms your bosom, just, just stays there. Never goes away. Whether things are going good or not so good, it's just joy. Because I'm trusting. You know what? You want to have joy? Trust God. If, you tr if you're trusting God in everything, you'll always be joyful. Because you know God's in control, and he's, and he's enough. He is all we need to accomplish his purpose in our life. God is, Jesus is enough. He's everything we need. So, okay, you might say, you know, what if this giant starts talking to me again? 
What if Goliath starts flapping his gums again at me? You remind him he's dead. Remind him he's dead. You start, you start with some Jesus talk. You know what Jesus talk is? Start quoting scripture. Start telling Goliath what Jesus thinks about him. You're defeated. You're, you've gone down. You're dead. Stop listening to what Goliath says and start listening to what God is saying. I'm talking about proclaiming the name of Jesus. I said proclaim the name of Jesus. And, you know, and I know we do that, and sometimes the giant doesn't go away immediately or in an instant. So what do we do? Just keep proclaiming the name of Jesus. I said, maybe you didn't hear me the first time, Goliath. Maybe you didn't hear me the first time, Satan. I need to, I'm proclaiming the name of Jesus. Greater is he that is in me than the one that is in the world. For this reason, the Son of God came. That is, for this reason, he was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the enemy. The, the enemy might come in like a flood, but the Spirit of the Lord sets up a standard against him. And so I got the victory. Goliath, you went down 2,000 years ago. The victory is already obtained. And listen, you're proclaiming the name of Jesus. You have the name. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the authority of the blood of the risen Lord Jesus. You have all this, the power of God's word flowing through your life. You have the power of the cross. You have the power of the resurrection. Your giant might be big, but the name of Jesus is bigger. And when you, when you believe and you know and you confess and you proclaim that Jesus is bigger than whatever it is you're facing, something has to, something will shift in your life. And you will experience the victory that Jesus won for us on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming. Well, pastor, I've been proclaiming for a week. Keep proclaiming. Pastor, I've been proclaiming for a month. Keep proclaiming. Keep standing on his word. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep remembering the cross. Keep remembering his power, his authority, his name, the cross, his blood. Keep remembering. Keep quoting scripture. Keep quoting what the scripture already has said about us. Goliath is dead. I'm just going to take a couple minutes to talk about the first giant we face, and we'll, we'll get into more in depth on uh, Wednesday. So the first giant that we address is the giant of fear. The first giant we're going to take down, address, is the giant of fear. Now, fear grips us. Fear is a real thing. Fear is a real thing. It grips us. And when it, whenever uh, we believe that we're apart from or in spite of our best efforts, something this undesirable is going to happen to us, we, we become fearful. And, and, and so many times we can't even stop. We can't stop it. Have you ever felt like paralyzed by fear? It's not a good feeling. Because we think that something's going to happen to us, and we can't stop it. And we can't stop it. And did you know most lies, if not all lies, are, are us, oh, excuse me, all fear comes from most, almost all, if not all, the time, comes from us believing a lie? We literally will partner with a lie and walk in that lie, and it, bring, and it brings fear. It brings fear and it paralyzes us. And, uh, you know, fear brings health issues. And, and we lose sleep. And we're partnering with the lie. We're not, we're not standing on God's truth. We're not standing on God's truth. We're believing a lie. We're partnering with the lie. We're walking in a lie. We're fearful. Because if we believed God's word, we'd know that he's with us. And that he's in control. And he's defeated any giant. And no matter what comes my way, God will work it out. For my good. You know, I heard a, a pastor, either I read it or I heard him say it. I think, I think I read it. He said five years ago, and he said, I'm not trying to brag. I just want to inspire people to do, to do good things. He said, I, I helped this guy, a homeless, he was a homeless guy, in front of like a, a, I don't know if it was a coffee shop or some place to eat. And he said, uh, he said I, I, I helped him that day. I told him about the Lord, and I gave him something to eat, and I just kept going. Never saw the guy again, ever. He said, five years later, I ran into him, this guy at a conference. And he said the guy was in a suit. He looked healthy. He looked strong. And within those five years, that homeless guy, because somebody encouraged him in the Lord and helped him financially, so the guy had authored five books and now was speaking in conferences, and his life was all put back together. The power of the gospel. Five years later, authored five books. 
I could barely write my term papers in college, and, and this guy's wrote five books in five years. And, and he, he came out of that situation. A lot of times we find ourselves in very bad predicaments because uh, we believe lies. But God, when, when God comes into our life, he breaks those giants, and he, he brings us out of fear, and we can live a life of freedom and joy. Fear, no matter what kind of fear it is, always affects us. Always affects us. The scripture, do you know the scripture addresses fear? Three, it's, it speaks about it in one way or another 366 times. 366. So you know what that means, right? One for every day. And even the 66th one, 366th one on leap years. This is a leap year. So even uh, an extra one in there for leap years. 366 times we're told do not fear. Listen, fear shows up as anxiety. Nervousness, worry, stress, dread, or tension, stomach problems, robs us, of, robs us of sleep and rest. Sometimes we sleep and we don't feel rested because we're worried even in our sleep. And then fear even tries to steal our praise. Right? How many times has somebody been in a church, worship is going, we're worshiping the Lord, and we're worrying about something, and not praising the Lord? We're worried about something, fearful about something, anxious about something, and... 20, 25 minutes gone by, and we realize, I didn't even worship the Lord today. I don't want you to raise your hand if that's happened to you, but I know it's happened. Probably to all of us at some point or another, it's interfered. But fear doesn't have the ultimate power. Jesus has the ultimate power. Fear will try to choke the life out of us, but the giant of fear is already dead. It was conquered by Jesus on the cross. In the name of Jesus, the giant of fear must fall. So real quickly, I'm going to give you three symptoms of a deeper cause. Uh, we're going to dig down and get to the root of fear, but I want to give you at least three, three root causes. I'll go deeper on Wednesday. So I'm going to give it to you real quickly, and I'll ask Luis to join me because um, we're going to get ready to conclude. So um, again, I'm going to go through this quickly. Three root causes. I'm not saying it's every cause, but three root, at least three root causes that, or, uh, that come that bring fear. So fear comes from our conditioning. Listen, I'm almost done, so give me your attention for the last few minutes. Some people are raised in an environment of fear and worry. In their homes, fear and worry. Family dynamics. Treating life like it's one big threat that never diminishes. Something bad can happen at any time. One time I just remember, this one story sticks out to me. One time I was at, at a park, and this little girl was maybe five or six, and she was with her family, and there was a, like a little retaining wall I mean, maybe two feet tall. And one of the parents kept saying to the little girl, get down from there, you're going to fall. Get down from there, you're going to fall. Get down from there, you're going to fall. I mean, even if she fell, I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't going to be like a bad injury. It was a really small, I mean, to here maybe. But she was walking and having fun. And the parent kept saying, get down from there, you're going to fall. Get down from there, you're going to fall. And I, even then, I thought, like, isn't, that's kind of like, isn't that what kids do? Like run along walls and stuff? And I just thought, man, I wonder if, and I thought to myself, I wonder if they're instilling fear in that, that little girl. Right, already, like any little thing, you, you got to be afraid. I mean, kids fall, right? I mean, I don't, we don't want our kids to get hurt, but they fall. Kids fall. Especially little boys. The little boys always get hurt. They always fall. But I, this I mean, makes them tougher. I mean, that's how I look at it, you know. It makes them tougher. I mean, you're going you're gonna to get bumps and bruises, and you're going to fall in life. It's like an analogy. Like, and then when they fall, you just get them back up. I'm like, oh, it's okay. Go ahead. It's going to be okay. Keep playing. Right? I mean, but I, I thought, man, that, that child could be being raised in an environment of fear. And I, I really, even in the moment, I thought about that. So sometimes we're raising that. It comes from our conditioning. Now, fear comes from concealing. Concealing. Anytime we conceal something major under the hood of our lives, fear is allowed to flourish. And then we feel ashamed and we don't want to be thought of, of anything less than perfect. And so we need to go to the cross and shed those feelings at the foot of the cross and release them to the Lord and allow his love and mercy to transform us. Just set it down and move forward. And then fear comes from our controlling. Some people want to control everything. Conversations, circumstances, other people's lives. When they realize they can't control everything, especially how people act, you can't control how people act. And then it brings fear because you can't control people. It brings stress, worry, and anxiety is born. 
and the, the what ifs will drive you crazy. Well, what if this? Well, what if that? If they would just listen to me, what if, you know? And you know the truth, you want to know the truth about controlling? We cannot control anyone. And in fact, we cannot control anything. See, see, uh, parents think, parents think they're controlling their children and trying. But in all honesty, our children leave our homes. And to be honest here, we want to raise them the right way, right values and all that. And we trust that they'll do the right things when they leave. But, I, but we all know that there are many children who leave their homes and don't do the right thing. They just don't. And we can't, and that, you know what that means? You're not in control of your children. So we don't control what we do is we influence. I'm giving parenting tips right now. We influence them. If we influence them by coming to the house of the Lord, by living righteous lives, being holy, uh, being good, kind, gracious, people of God, we'll influence them. We'll let them see the blessings of God, the joy of serving God. We influence them with our values and our beliefs based out of the scriptures. We influence them and that's our best chance of seeing them succeed in life because we cannot control them. We cannot control them. And if, you, if you're trying to control every conversation, every, every situation, circumstance, and, and you're trying to control other people, you're setting yourself up for great disappointment. And if you're gonna be worried that, they're, that you're not in control, you're gonna be very, very fearful because you cannot control anybody. And then finally, real quickly, Jesus replaces what the giants are saying to us. So we have to always remind ourselves that God is able. Somebody say, God is able. We have to remind ourselves that God is able. Number two, we have to set the Lord always before us. Psalm 16, 8, David said, David, the one who defeated Goliath, said, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Somebody say, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken in Jesus' name. Right hand in the Old Testament means valued, honored, and even intimate position. So he's saying that that he's at the right, that Jesus is at the right hand, that he will not be shaken, valued, honored. So when we keep Jesus in the valued, honored, and even intimate position, we will not be shaken. David Lee, David was saying, I constantly keep my focus fixed on God, someone bigger than Goliath. And he said, I won't be shaken because of that. Right? Set our eyes always on him. And then verse 9, he says, therefore my, gla- my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices and my body will also rest secure. No fear. He's resting secure. He's praising God. His, his, his praise isn't, isn't taken from him and his heart is glad. Number three, we have to name what is keeping us up at night. So like I said, first, we remind ourselves that God is able. We set the Lord always before us. We name what is keeping us up at night. So instead of dealing with the fruit, so we, we, we say, pray for me, I, I, fear, I feel anxious, right? We want to deal with the root. See, you're anxious because of something. See, we pray, sure, we pray for anxiety, but it's actually something that's causing you anxiety that we have to deal with. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the fruit, but we got to deal with the root. What is making you anxious? You're not, most people aren't usually anxious for nothing. There's usually something that's making us anxious. So we have to, we have to name it. Anxiety is the result, but what is actually causing the anxiety? For example, I'm anxious because I have a $996 PG&E bill that I cannot pay. And I, I, don't, I can't live without electricity. I don't know about you, but I need electricity. So that could cause me to be anxious, be fearful. So we name it and place it in God's hands and we trust him. You understand? So the root, so we're not anxious for nothing. Something's causing the anxiety. We name that something and give it to God and we trust him and know that he will provide. He will provide. Then the last thing, we fill our mouths with praise. David said, I've set the Lord always before me because he's at my, he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my, my tongue rejoices. His tongue rejoices means he's praising God. So we set our eyes on Jesus. Worship flows from our mouth. The song of praise is on our lips. Seeing Jesus makes our heart glad and restores our rest. We sing because we see God. The antidote to fear is faith. Again, believing and trusting God. God encourages us to put on a a garment of praise when we feel the spirit of heaviness coming on, when fear tries to overwhelm us. 
to sing in the face of adversity and uncertainty about a sure and unchanging God. And we will see the giants fall in our lives. Please bow your heads with me.